Great. Thanks, Matt. Uh, it's an ex exciting week for our club, uh, having secured the signature of Shaq Moore. Obviously, it's been a, a long and, and well-documented process from when we first started to, to having Shaq in the door here now. And, you know, we're delighted to have him here in market and, and to start his next chapter in his journey here with us here at Nashville SC. So to, to integrate Shaq into our team and, uh, you know, a key part of our plans for the summer window, it's certainly encouraging for us to be able to do that. Uh, on a related front, uh, you know, absolutely delighted to be able to extend uh, my contract to be here in Nashville uh, that much longer. Uh, it's always been a, you know, a, an aim of mine to be able to not only to help uh, build this club, but to be in a situation to help continue to kind of re reach new heights and to see what the club has done in each of our first two seasons. And we're moving into now in, in a new building and exciting opportunities in front of us. Uh, you know, even as ex expectations continue to kind of rise around the club, it's really important that I think uh, our staff uh, has really done a great job in, in not only identifying players that can help us be successful, but to also stay focused and uh, cut the noise out around us and really focus on what we're trying to do, which is to, to put our club in position each year to, to be in the tournament, which is the MLS playoffs. And, you know, if we can get a chance to be in a tournament each year, you know, we give uh, Gary and our players the best opportunity to, to take the next step and, and do what we all aspire to. Thank you, Mike. We will start with Tom Bogert, and before we get started with Tommy, I will lower your hand once you ask a question. If you do have a follow-up, just feel free to raise that hand back up. Go ahead, Tom. Thanks, Bogert. Thanks, Mike, for taking the time. Congrats on the extension. Something funny? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm <sorry. laughs> uh, just going to say, what, are, what were the talks like, I guess, with, with Ian and with ownership about your contract? I'm not sure if it was coming close to an end after this season or not, but, but kind of talk us through what that discussion back and forth was like. Sure, and thanks, Tom. I appreciate it. Uh, you know, it was a pretty easy one from the standpoint that it's not contentious at all because uh, you know I was really transparent about the idea of wanting to be here in Nashville, and you know I think John, our ownership group, uh, Ian, and club leadership uh, want to continue that as well. So you know the idea of getting to the opportunity to extend that uh, to create some continuity uh, for our group. Uh, knowing that this you know, this journey continues to kind of go on, it was exciting all around, and you know, it really was a, a pretty quick process from that standpoint. Thank you, Mike. Next, we go to Tim Sullivan. Go ahead, Tim. Hey, you, you shouldn't tell him that you want to be a Nash player. You're giving up negotiating leverage, Mike. But <laughs> you mentioned uh, um, how excited you are to have Shaq joining the team. Are you expecting that he's he's the only big piece that you add in this window? Is that um, kind of how you see this window playing out, or are you still uh, involved in the transfer market for the rest of, you know, two weeks here? You know, big piece would be relative, I guess, to how you look at it. But, you know, from our standpoint, I, I think sometimes what gets lost is, you know, it, it's it's not like uh, fantasy football or FIFA, you know, where transactions happen, like, you know, within the minute. It, the reality is uh, a lot of these deals take not only days, but, but weeks, months, and in some cases years. So, uh, you know, we have some other things they're working on. Uh, we're continuing to be patient from the standpoint that it's not about just adding players, adding the right players, uh, and we feel confident that, you know, where there certainly is potential to maybe add other pieces this window, we're also not going to flinch and press from the standpoint that we've got a group that's, that's done an awful lot, uh, uh, especially with the, the, you know, the rash of road games we started the season with and the points we collected. And I kind of feel like it's not a group that needs to have wholesale changes. Uh, I think what happens sometimes, and you know, I, I can totally appreciate it also, because everyone wants to obviously be actively involved. You know, when a transfer window is open, it, it's not necessarily just grab as many players as you can. You know, sometimes that, that can have an adverse effect also. And, and for us, we didn't go into this window thinking we needed to make wholesale changes or, or add five players. You know, we kind of felt like if the right pieces fell the way they did, we'd acquire them and, and we'll continue to kind of follow that same approach. Next, we go to Drake Hills. Go ahead, Drake. Yeah, I'll be the next to say congrats on the extension, Mike. Um, Two-part question for me, just to follow up a little bit on, on Tim's and spin it a different way. Um, in terms of the, the, the standard that you guys have set uh, in terms of a playoff team, um, you talked about um, not feeling like you guys belong there, but you've worked to there and you've, you've essentially become a, a playoff team in those first couple of years. Does adding to that roster potentially – affect how you guys think about your playoff run this year, getting into the postseason and competing to the level that you guys are, are expecting. And then the second part is, given that you guys have talked about openly 
upgrading at the right back position dating back to earlier this year. Um, when did the negotiations and the efforts to get Shaq, when did those heat up um, in terms of getting him to Nashville? Well, thanks, Drake, and I appreciate that. Uh, you know, I guess what I would say is, uh, you know, the first part of that question you know, I addressed the players this morning, and, you know, I talked about expectations and about, you know, the approach you should have. And, you know, I spoke to, uh, to a friend the other day who, who coaches a, a different team, a different sport, and he was saying how he expects to win every game he coaches. And, you know, he asked me if I'm the same. And, you know, I, I said, I don't expect to win any game that we play. And, and I say that because I think that's disrespectful to the sport. I think it's disrespectful to your players. I think it has a level of entitlement and complacency. Uh, I appreciate how hard you have to work to win each day. Uh, this league is like really, really challenging, you know. So I think where I believe we can beat anyone we played against, uh, we've not gone into a game where I didn't think we could win. Could win. I definitely don't expect to win games, or you know, or assume we'll win games. Uh, because of that I, I think we've identified players and a coaching staff that that uh, you know works with a swagger and a chip on their shoulder with something to prove. And and I love the fact that our guys can potentially overachieve at times because of that. And you know, I, I think by adding players the likes of Shaq. Uh, does that mean our expectations rise? To me, a lot of that comes down to you know, really how our players and staff deal with the noise and distractions around them. I think where maybe expectations will raise from fans, from media, I uh, totally get and appreciate that. From our standpoint, I, I think we're being ne neglectful if we're focusing too much on, on where we think we should be rather than focusing on our next match, which is Cincinnati. Uh, in, in regards to the second question, you know, I, I want to also stress – you know, this process for us started kind of toward last season. Uh, Alistair Johnson, who I'm a big fan of and, and I like an awful lot, uh, you know, where he didn't necessarily play right back in the back four for us an awful lot last year. He actually played le less than half our matches last year at right back in the back four. It was a spot really we'd always kind of look to kind of to, to address knowing how Gary's teams like to try to play. Uh, you know, uh, early on in our first group, we brought in Brian Beckless, you know, from Honduras. We were able to get him fairly inexpensive, uh, you know, and with an option. So it ended up being, you know, pretty user-friendly for us, kind of no-lose to, to bring in someone like Brian. Uh, we drafted Alistair from the standpoint of, of giving us an opportunity to have someone that we thought maybe could develop into a right-sided player, uh, whether it was uh, in a back five, which Gary uses a, a, a lot in, as a right wing back, whether it was a right back and a back four, which – really didn't do as much, and maybe that was Gary's comfort also with the players he had. Uh, the reality is, I think, toward the, the end of the stretch for Alistair, he played primarily as like a right center back, which is where he's been used in Canada. Uh, I think, you know, we'd always been looking, trying to, to upgrade and improve that right back spot, and really to have someone to play in a back four and a back five in that role. I think as we went through last season and, you know, the challenges with trying to put Alistair in a new deal, I think with what he wanted and with where we saw him, you know, part of us also kind of thought if this is what it would take to sign the player X at that amount, what else is out there at that amount? And you know, very early on for us, the idea was if we're going to invest like that in the right back, you know, maybe we need to, to raise our bar as far as what we're looking to try to do in that role. And I would tell you very early on and very quickly that, that target became Shaq. Uh, there has never been a player that we've signed for our club that Gary Smith hasn't signed off on uh, in any position in any year. Uh, for us, I would say we probably looked at somewhere between 30 and 40 right backs uh, over the last two years. Uh, very quickly as we started looking at someone like Shaq, I would tell you that happened early on, and I would say very early on, most right backs Gary looked at, he compared to Shaq. You know, so in different countries, different leagues, I'd ask him for feedback. He'd say, well, this guy's good, but he doesn't attack like Shaq. Uh, you know, I like this guy, but he's not as good a 1v1 defender as Shaq. You know, and I think what happened was at that point, you know, especially when we got an offer for Alistair where we weren't necessarily shopping him, it was kind of like an offer we couldn't refuse when you see what we were offered for him. Uh, to me, I, I haven't run across a person who had, didn't tell me that it was a good deal for us to do that. Uh, and for us, the idea of doing that was always, you know, with the end justifying the mean for us to use that to reinvest back in our group. You know, we spent a lot of time critically looking at how much percentage of cap we want to spend in certain positions in the field. I think we can look at the complete group we have right now no, we don't have to add a lot of different players to make our team an MLS Cup contender. I mean, the reality is in our first two seasons, we've been in the last eight teams each year. So I think, you know, we've already gotten there with the group we have to be competitive. Uh, knowing how, how much wide play is an influence in the things that, that our team wants to do, having a, a right back who can join up in the attack, who can bomb forward, who whip crosses in, uh, who can impact the game on both sides of the ball. Uh, one thing we talk about all the time is trying to find players who we think who influence winning. 
and for us, not just to try to upgrade it right back, to try to fill maybe a need maybe we really didn't have when we first started our team in 2020, but to also be able to find one that we think influences winning. Uh, to us, it was a no-brainer to not only pursue Shaq, but to do whatever we thought we had to do to, to acquire him. Thank you, Mike. Next, we'll go to Wes Bowling and then Ben Wright. Go ahead, Wes. Mike, congratulations, number four, I think it is. Uh, what's the biggest thing you've learned in the three years of this MLS build that you'll take forward with you now as you move from an expansion building stage and development stage to a sustaining phase for this team? Uh, Wes, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. So, uh, um, you know, Tommy, I wasn't laughing at you before. I, I think I was a uh, uh, part of this for me, too. I, I, <laughs> you know, I... Uh, uh, Part of me also, I think, just talking about this journey or this path, uh, you know, I was telling someone the other day, uh, for our staff, I think it's really important that, you know, that everyone takes their jobs really seriously, but they don't take themselves so seriously. You know, part of me just thinks it's amazing to think we're talking about something like this, to even get a chance to do this. You know, I mean, to me, uh, uh, totally humbled and appreciative, but uh, way more comfortable talking about, like, Shaq or the window or other things, you know. So, um, you know, what I've learned along the way, uh, I, I think people who are on the outside of our group, and it's a very small group, whether it's uh, being inside our locker room, inside uh, our team, and uh, I can't give enough kudos to our team, to uh, Assistant General Manager Ali McKay, Director of Player Personnel Chance Myers, uh, Senior Director of Strategy and Analytics Oliver Miller-Farrell, uh, you know, our manager Gary Smith, uh, our CEO Ian Ayer. Uh, you know, I think we work very collaboratively, co collaboratively in trying to identify the right players that we think fit our team and our league. I think, Wes, to answer your question, I think what I've learned is uh, I think people who are not on the inside sometimes don't understand how hard it is to execute things, like I mentioned earlier, maybe like the, the, uh, that you can do in, in seconds or minutes in a video game. It's just not really like that. You know, uh, uh, you know, you'll appreciate, a, um, you know, at least uh, one of the members of the media who are on here, I, I talk about a lot with a different sport. And, you know, uh, um, you know, the idea of following as a fan and saying, well, why isn't the GM doing this? Or why isn't the coach doing this? And then two months later, it's like you had that aha moment, like, oh, that does make sense. But now I see what they were doing. Uh, I think the challenge sometimes that, that we have is less in creating a plan but more in making sure that the outside noise doesn't compromise it and make sure that we kind of stay focused on, on what our plan is. Uh, I don't think my responsibility is to try to show our game plan or our blueprint to the world. I think it's to make sure it's executed. And I think if, if we can do that, it's less about taking credit and patting ourselves in the back and more about just maybe really kind of staying focused on what our job is. And, and a league like ours that, that can be challenging at times with a, a salary cap on a few leagues in the world that has that, uh, a league that, that plays in summer months where players come from abroad and just aren't used to playing in this kind of climate, these kind of demands. Uh, you know, with as, as hard as it is to win the road, as it's well documented, you know, how few teams get points in the road in our league. I think uh, knowing all those things and throwing it in a blender and kind of putting it all together, it's just important to make sure that, that we just kind of stay focused on what our job is and, and I, I guess just not get distracted with a lot of the other peripheral things. Thank you, Mike. Next we'll go to Ben Wright and Gentry Estes. Go ahead, Ben. Yeah, Mike, um, I guess I'll be the fifth to say congrats. Um, so congrats on the new deal. Um, we've talked a good bit in the past just kind of about the, the variety of spending across MLS, even though it's a, a salary cap league, how it varies significantly from team to team. Um, what's, your, what's your kind of expectation for, that, for Nashville, um, how they play into that in the next couple of years, and does having your own venue in your own stadium in, impact that, that ability to spend at all? Ben, thanks a lot. I appreciate that. Uh, you know, from a spending standpoint, it's funny because, you know, like I, I'm definitely a self-proclaimed money ball theorist, you know, and uh, uh, I feel like sometimes I have to, yeah, Tim, really, yeah, <laughs> I have to apologize sometimes for that because, you know, I, I think people sometimes take it for something that's not, you know. Uh, uh, you know, the idea of, like, spending, like, efficiently, I, I just can't believe in, like, any industry people wouldn't want to do that. Uh, I, I think the idea of, of going in an interview and saying the only way you can do this is a blank check budget, I, I just can't believe someone get hired like that. You know? So you know, for me, the idea about trying to take a really measured approach into who we're trying to sign, I think even if transfer budgets increase, I think we're still going to be thoughtful about that. And you know, I think thoughtful as, as a synonym is not just like a, a pleasantry. It, it's, it's being full of thought. It's, it's, it's acting rationally and measured. And look, uh, uh, no one gets 100% of their deals right in any sport, in any league in the world.
You know, that's a fact. You know, so uh, I think the reason why we've probably been so uh, intentional with domestic recruitment is, you know, the, the margin of error is different. You know, and I once said, you know, between coaching and recruiting in university, uh, working in MLS, you know, at one point I counted, I think it was close to 90% of the domestic players in our league either had watched as youth players and recruited in college, uh, watched in college and scouted in MLS, or coached myself. You know, so I, I think that there's just less margin of error when, when you're looking at players like that. And the reality is international recruitment for any club in the world and, and any club in our league is going to be challenging. You know, so I think for us, I think the potential of expectations, you know, with the, whether that goes up or not with our spending, you know, we just have to make sure that, you know, knowing that the margin of error increases with players you see less, the players that, you know, maybe cost more, you know, the reality is we're just never going to be uh, the highest spending team in a league. So we have to make sure that we're always really mindful of like trying to maximize the money we have. And, you know, for every one we get wrong, we'll also look at, you know, Randall Leal for less than a million dollars. People ask me, like, how did you do that? You know, or like an MVP candidate for less than $3 million. You know, and, you know, you know, we're really proud of those. I would tell you, I also look at the ones maybe we get wrong and try to think how to do it differently. Um, because then you can always get better. And, you know, I, I have to tell you, we're going to continue to get them wrong, too, like every team does. And to me, again, not taking myself so seriously, like I know we're going to make mistakes. You know, it's a, it's a reason why we sign so many players with options after our first year, because we were expected to make mistakes and we can kind of pivot. And I think we'll always try to be a group that's kind of malleable, that can kind of bend and change. And, and the hope is, whether it's window to window or not, that we can, you know, we can pivot. Uh, the question you asked about the stadium is great because you know, I was saying this to Shaq today. Uh, one thing that's really important for us, like in our recruitment strategy, and whether this is sharing a, you know, a peek behind the curtain, what, what's really important to us is, I think, for re re recruiting is retention. Uh, if the players you have are happy, not only will they want to stay, other good players are going to come. Uh, you know, you only have to, when the content comes out, to see Shaq's impressions of when he first went out to Geodis Park the first time. Uh, where he is a, a man and he's played abroad, it was the, the expression look of a kid who was like in a candy store. Uh, I have to tell you, like, I was really proud and emotional watching that because it makes you realize, like, all of us growing up, wanting to be a professional athlete and wanting to do all these different things, to see a kid achieve his dream was really, really special. And I just think by having the opportunity to offer something like that, you know, I said this to him, I said to his agent, to his father, uh, when you see that, when you see guys like he and Walker, you know, hopefully we'll play big roles in our, in our national team in this next World Cup. My guess is whether it's internationals for our country, players around the league, players abroad, you're going to look at that and say, I want to be like those guys. So uh, it's, it's a massive recruiting tool for us, for sure. Thank you, Mike. We'll go to Gentry Estes, then Chris Harris, then we'll swing back around for follow-ups. Go ahead, Gentry. Yeah, hey, Mike. Um, I know this is kind of an annual thing now that you make a, a pretty big mid-season addition and I'm curious how much of that has been the fact that you've had a contending team this entire time that you kind of are gearing up for the rest of the year, but also I'm curious how it might have changed this year that you're in your new stadium as opposed to building toward that. You guys are actually there now. And also you've had the experience of playing in the U S open cup that maybe exposed a few depth concerns on the roster that, that you did in the first couple of years. Uh, Gentry, thanks. It's a great question, and I said there's a couple parts to that. I'm trying to see how to hit those one at a time. Uh, you know, uh, as far as recruitment in the windows, it's interesting because every club is different. You know, uh, uh, I've been around people who do not want to bring players in during the summer window because it's the middle of the season. Uh, you know, conversely, the reality is, you know, our calendar is unique to most other leagues in the world, and, you know, the summer window for most leagues in the world is like our winter window. It's like the off season. You know, so the reality is there's just some players we're trying to pursue that just aren't available during the winter window. You know, look, we, look it's, it was pretty well documented. We were trying to bring Shaq in in January. You know, we just couldn't get him loose that time because of the middle of his season. You know, so as much as we pushed and prodded, it just wasn't going to happen, you know. So, uh, you know, I, I do think there are opportunities in the summer window with different players being available. I mean, it's a different tax bracket of players available. But also, I mean, you know, there's an adaptation period to any new player when they come in. And I think, you know, there are some challenges bringing players in in the middle of the year, depending on where they're coming from. Uh, in our league, I think you've seen challenges, the reality of the economics. I mean, most players from Europe, you know, who are playing at top leagues can make significantly more money, like, playing in those leagues. Uh, the reality of getting a Hani Mukhtar or a Shaq Moore in their prime age from Europe is very unique. 
You know, the reality is there's a reason why our league's teams tend to recruit and you know, dip their toe in the water in South America so often because it's an easier opportunity to acquire better players and a price point more comparable to our league. And that's a fact. You know, uh, uh, so I, I think there, there's risk you run by, you know, recruitment in the summer versus the window or, or winter or vice versa. Uh, you know, I think for us, we've been active in, in each of the, the, the years, which, which I appreciate. I think we've, for me, I, I think, and our recruitment team, we always want to be in a situation where we want to try to help, like I mentioned, give our team an extra push to try to get in the playoffs, to get in the tournament, you know. And, and I think what, what's unique about this year specifically is, you know, as we get into year three, there's just a less holes or needs that we have in our group. You know, so whether it's the percent of money we're going to invest in a certain role in the field, whether well, it's where our focus lies, I think we kind of feel like opposed to a team maybe like year one for us where we're trying to add 30 players. I, I think we feel like we don't have that many players we have to add to make this group. It's already a competitive one, but maybe to take it to the next step. Uh, the other part of the question, Jennifer, you asked you mentioned about Open Cup. And, you know, I, I think a challenge that we have, and it's not just in our league, and it's not any of you guys' media in our league, it's, it's, it's our sport, you know. Uh, I think the idea of a manager walking off the field and putting a microphone in front of his face, you know, like literally like seconds after walking off the field after a match, when emotionally, you know, they're just, they're just not maybe as, I don't want to say rational, as measured maybe as maybe they'd want you know, uh, uh, what I would say about Open Cup, you know, uh, we played our biggest rival in Atlanta United on a Wednesday night, uh, 120 minutes uh, with a full complement of players. And then we're asked to play, you know, in three days later on the road in Houston. And I don't know if any of you guys have played in Houston. I'm assuming none of you have, but have been in Houston. Uh, not only is it hard to go there in general, I mean, like in the, in, in those, in the, the summer months, that heat, it's oppressive, you know. So in any situation has to do that is hard. To have to do it three days later after playing 120 minutes is challenging. And I think it's a little unrealistic to think that a group can do that against their biggest rival, some of that kind of energy, and then be asked to turn around three days later in those conditions and put like a repeat performance up. I mean, honestly, I think it's kind of unrealistic. And I think it's kind of unfair to no one's fault to think that someone rational or, or measured would give you a response like that. Uh, I think the reality is that where I think our league and most, our, our team in most cases, is as deep a team as, as you'll find in the league. Uh, you know, I regularly have contemporaries who ask me about trading one of, like, one of our four starting midfielders that we have, one of our three starting center backs we have, one of our two starting goalkeepers we have. Uh, but the reality is, in, in a salary cap league, I mean, it's just never going to be deep enough. Uh, Seattle won CCL, and they're not deep enough. You know, I mean, we're a competitive team, we're not deep enough. You know, but, but I would say, but, but it's, it's not in comparison to other teams in our league, because I think we look around, I, I think we've got really good depth compared to the rest of the league. So uh, I absolutely appreciate that. Uh, Open Cup absolutely stre stretches and stresses that like no other sport we have in our country to have to play games like that in such short rest. I mean, look, this last week, I mean, we had to play three matches in a week. You know, I mean, and you saw an awful performance by, you know, all concerned in Charlotte, a tremendous performance three days later against Seattle, maybe mixed reviews three days later against LAFC. Uh, it's just, I think we have to be rational about it and Look, uh, I'm, I'm a, as big a fan as it gets in, in other sports and other teams, but I also know a fan is short for fanatic, you know, and you're kind of irrational. And I think it's just unrealistic to think that, you know, you're going to be able to put together games in three days rest with all your best players playing all those minutes. Uh, I think especially with some of the miles some of our guys cover, guys like Sean Davis and Alex Mule, who are regularly among the league leaders in distance covered, I, I think it's unrealistic to think that's going to happen all the time. And to your point, I think Open Cup shows that. I don't know that it exposes it as much as I think it exposes the realities of our league and our sport also. Thank you, Mike. Next we go to Chris Harris and then Tom Boger. Go ahead, Chris. Hey, Mike. Congrats. Um, and with regards to the contract, you know, when you first got here, we talked about how excited you were just to grow something from the ground up. I'm curious over the last three years and kind of with that in mind, how you've seen your role and maybe how you perform in your role evolve as the team has evolved and grown forward. It's been uh, amazing to see what's happened in such a short period of time. And, and I look at guys like Ben and Tim who covered the, the USL version of this club, you know, uh, to think about a team that started really, uh, you know, as a vision or an idea of a couple people and to see it grow into, you know, a genuine threat in, in MLS. It's, it's, it's humbling, right? So uh, I think where my role or job has changed and, you know, some of the questions have been asked previously, uh, I think, from trying to build a team of, of 30 players you're trying to bring in to maybe now sitting in a window, maybe looking at one, maybe two pieces 
to go from like completing a roster to being an MLS Cup contender, you know, it's 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 been pretty cool. And you know, expectations rise around that. I think in year one, you know, I, I mentioned and. You know, if West Bowling is still on here, you know he had a reference recently. You know I talked about uh, in year one that my my goal was when you watch our team play, you couldn't tell who the expansion team was, you know, and who was the existing team, and and I think you know we we more than accomplished that, and you know I, I think as as expectations grow around our group, you know I I have very high expectations for myself, uh, absolutely driven by the fear of failure. Uh, there's no question in my mind that uh, I just don't believe we'll fail because we won't allow it to happen. Uh, but also, uh, I appreciate expectations being higher in our group, and you know, maybe I don't like to, that they're unrealistic at times. I also appreciate people have high expectations are because they care about this team, they believe in it, they want to see it achieve, and you know, maybe part of my job, which changed, is has gone from trying to be like P.T. Barnum and trying to you know, drum up people talking about our team, promoting our team, to maybe trying to like lessen expectations around us also. Uh, I also, uh, you know, a firm believer in like under-promising and over-delivering, you know, and not as a cliche, but like legitimately. I think, uh, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, the disease of more can like, can you really like, uh, you know, it, it can damage a group. And I think for us, I think in some ways, maybe rather than trying to convince people they're capable or convince fans we're special, probably as we've gone from, from year one to year three, it's probably more about trying to temper expectations outside of our group. Go ahead, Tom. Go ahead and change the subject a little bit, but just kind of uh, a topic around the league right now. Um, when you look at Brennan Aronson going for another transfer and, and the sell-on clause, now Chris Richards for Dallas and the sell-on clause. I just kind of wanted to get your thoughts of that, that trend across the league and how integral kind of those are to deals outgoing, whether it's within the league or outside of the league. Tom, it's an interesting question because, uh, you know, that's one thing I hear sometimes also. Well, well, this league's a selling league, right? This league's a buying league. I, I think any league that's a good league is a selling league, right? I mean, like, you know, if, I think the – as you look at MLS 3.0, I mean, I think it's the responsibility of, of a good ownership group, of a good collection of owners in a league to create a product where your players are in such demand that, you know, that they can be sold on and turn a profit in that. And I think anybody doesn't, doesn't think that's a sole function of the academy – that they have at their club is either naive, doesn't understand, or they're, they're being neglectful and not being truthful. You know, what the reality is the reason you have an academy is to feed your first team and eventually be able to sell players off. And, you know, I, I think there are some clubs that have more fertile territories. I mean, look at the success they've had, the record they've had about selling players on. There are some that have less. Uh, you know, I am eager and anticipate the idea of being able to sign future homegrowns from our academy to our first team. But uh, for sure, it's a slow roll in a process. And I think even when we start signing guys, I mean, I think it's going to be a while before we're developing players that we think we can eventually sell on, you know, to, to generate revenue off of them. But I, I think it's an important part, not only for our league, but for all leagues. I think it's been great to see the success that, that some of our clubs have done, you know, in being able to sell players off. And I think the challenge you always run into is how can you sell players while maintain being competitive as a team? And I think a lot comes down to holistically, culturally, who you want to be as a club. And I think for us, you know, just as we've been kind of strategic and thoughtful all the way along about building our roster, it'll be similar from the standpoint of trying to develop players that'll turn a profit for our club and be able to generate revenue without, without compromising the integrity of what we're trying to do on the field. Tim Sullivan, you're on with Mike Jacobs. Yeah, between you and Tom, I don't think I've ever heard two Knicks fans so positive about Shaq before, but... Uh... <laughs> looking at looking at um, how this deal came about, uh, my understanding is his contract with Tenerife ran through 2024. Transfer fee, I assume. Do you expect it, the uh, the deal overall to be a, a TAM signing? I know you have, currently have three designated players on the books. Is, the, is your expectation that that's the uh, mechanism that you're using? Tim, you know, it's funny. My girlfriend now makes a funny face when she sees that Tom texts me, and it's not about the Knicks. She's like, wait a second, he's a soccer writer? <laughs> uh, you know, uh, uh, the deal for Shaq, uh, you know, the reality is when you look at the combination of a budget number, right, that's their base salary uh, fees like agent fees, but it's also their transfer fee, right? So the budget number a player has is very different than their base salary, right? The base salary is part of the budget number. Uh, for us, I mean, I, I think a big factor into where he fits in, Tim, like as a, as a TAM player, comes back to something I was saying earlier about the percentage 
of money of cap that we're going to put into a certain player. Uh, the equivalent of the book Moneyball for the NFL is caponomics. And, you know, what's interesting is uh, they talk about the percentage of certain positions on the cap. And, you know, you look at the idea of the Seattle Seahawks and what they did when the Super Bowl, Russell Wilson may be getting 2% of their cap to then seeing what happened to their team when you had a large percentage go up for that position. And I think there's a reason why, although it be a different sport, why do so many teams draft quarterbacks in the first round? Because they're hoping to hit it on a player with a low percentage. Uh, you know, Tom and I, as, as we rant about the New York Knickerbockers, talk about the idea about NBA teams acquiring players on rookie contracts and what it does to a roster. You know, so, you know, I mention all that because, you know, in our plan to invest such a significant percentage, uh, maybe in a player not in our spine, maybe it was a little bit of a pivot for us. Uh, and I would tell you it was less because we said we need to invest more percentage of our cap in a right back. Uh, it was less of that. It was more the fact that we just really believed in Shaq more. Uh, we think he has potentially been an impactful player in our league. And for us to add a player like that, uh, not only to a back line that, you know, you have, you know, three players, if you include Walker and Dan Loves, have gotten a significant amount of international experience for the U.S. national team. But also when you see what he does on the other side of the ball, and you think about watching our team play and how important that is to, to having uh, good wide play, um, combination play on the flanks, combining with attacking players. I think the potential that Shaq has, what he has to do for us, you know, uh, we put a lot of careful consideration in, uh, into where we we're going to put him in regards to our cap. And it's a good question because, you know, where he is currently a TAM player, and obviously, you know, the, 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 a lot of that is based also on, you know, total budget number on his, on his transfer fee. For us, we think it's well worth it. Thank you, Mike. We'll go to Drake Hills and then wrap up today's session with Ben Wright. Go ahead, Drake. Mike, you mentioned earlier uh, Walker's obviously involvement with the national team. I'm, I'm curious, Phil, you know, uh, with now the potential Shaq and Walker playing next to each other, you know, Greg probably going to be at a few matches uh, later this fall. I'm just wanted to ask about um, what Shaq's intentions were when, when you began to, to speak with him about what he was looking for in his immediate future um, and his own personal and professional expectations. And then the second part of that is, you know, you mentioned Chance and, and Ali and, and Oliver. I'm curious and hopeful if you could shine some light on them through the lens of um, getting this deal done with Shaq and, and what they were doing on, on, the, on the inside. Sure. Sure. Uh, you know, the U.S. national team obviously is a different group and where we try to help Greg and his staff as much as possible. You know, I don't, I don't get too much into the devil and the details about, you know, where guys factor in the U.S. national team. Uh, what I can tell you is uh, I know for a fact from talking to Greg that a major factor of Shaq not only breaking in as a regular but being a key contributor to the group is featuring regularly. And when you look at the guys he's competing with in that role – being in teams where they play week in and week out is important. So and I think that's not just Greg. I think that's any national team manager. I think to play guys who aren't featuring regularly, they're not going to be fit. They're not going to be in, in, in good match form. So for Shaq, being somewhere where he was going to be valued enough, where he gets a chance to feature regularly was really important to him. Uh, talking to him today, the idea for the first time in his career to be so close to his family that are in the Atlanta area, uh, whether it's both family and friends, the idea to get a chance to do that you know, in front of and near his, you know, his closest people, his circle, I think was really important to him. And, you know, in regards to Walker, I mean, you know, very early on, I mentioned before from a recruitment piece, to know that he could play next to a key player in the U.S. national team in Walker, uh, you know, that, that absolutely is, a, is something that influenced the idea, not only Shaq coming back to the United States and to MLS, but to Nashville. Uh, the opportunity to create partnerships with somebody who's become a linchpin in the U.S. team, I think it's a great opportunity for Shaq. Uh, you know, we're excited about trying to help him pursue his goals. And, and I kind of feel like, uh, you know, the opportunity he has playing here in Nashville next to Walker for a manager like Gary and a team like this, I think it's a great opportunity for him. Uh, was there a second part of that, Drake? Did I miss it or no? Oh, uh, the other guys, yeah. Um, Look, uh, you know, I've mentioned before, uh, you know, it's like a closed cabinet. And, uh, you know, Ian's talked before about, you know, almost like, like, this, like this fabled, like, transfer committee that, that they was kind of made up in the media in some regards that when he was at Liverpool. And, you know, what I just think about what may we do a little differently in our group is, you know, we're ultimately maybe I'm tasked with making a decision, you know, on pulling a trigger on a deal. It's a very collaborative effort with a lot of people with different lenses. And, you know, having someone like Ali, who's been an agent previously, to help me with contract terms is, like, really important. 
And he sees the world a little differently. Uh, having someone like Chance Myers, who's as decorated a player in the same role Shaq plays, uh, it's pretty important because when he tells me this is an important attribute to have as a right back, I, he just knows more than anybody else, you know, sp specifically with that. Uh, for Oliver, what I'm looking at trying to determine what a player's market value is and comparing it not just like what somebody wants to, to pay or spend, but to know what the average salaries for a player in that role or an average transfer fee for a player in that role going in or coming out of MLS, going in or going out of Segunda, going in or going out of Tenerife. You know, it's, you know, the idea of having data like that, it's, you know, it's a currency, you know, and it's not just Tudor Peel's opinion shouting back and forth. It's not who do you like better, you know, uh, Messi or Ronaldo. It's because of these things, this is what it means. And I think having those three guys help with that process, along with Gary and Ian and, and, and John Ingram as well. You know, uh, I think when you have that many people involved as stakeholders, I, I think that it, it increases your odds of making good decisions. And I think it's a big reason why we've made so many good decisions on transfers and trades in the past and why I think we'll continue to with Shaq. Thank you, Mike. We will wrap up today's session with Ben Wright. Go ahead, Ben. Yeah, Mike, you touched a little bit kind of briefly earlier on about just the academy and, and kind of how you how you expect those to factor in. Um, how long are you anticipating it's going to be before we start seeing players come through the pipeline? And how are you expecting the, the, MLS, next, excuse me, the MLS Next Pro team that you guys just announced to factor into that development pipeline? That's a great question because, you know, we're obviously trying to accelerate things and try to catch up the rest of the league. You know, we're, we're starting late from the standpoint that, you know, you have teams that have had – Academies for almost, you know, I'm trying to think the initiative was 2007, right? When it first started, I think. So, I mean, like, uh, 2009. So, you know, you know we're, we're trying to play catch up. And, you know, what's helped is, uh, you know, the addition of Rumba Monfali as our player development coordinator. Uh, you know, Rumba worked with Sporting Kansas City in their youth academy. It was integral in helping players like Gianluca Busio not only transition on the first team, but, you know, into a U.S. national team player as well. And, you know, what Rumba's helping us do is really trying to focus on our top academy players and try to develop them into prospects. And to me, what a prospect is not necessarily any kid who wears a Nashville jersey in an academy game. It's someone we think could become a first team player. Uh, I was involved in, in that role responsibility when I was in Kansas City, and to have people like Rumba working with Kevin Flanagan and try to identify those players, hopefully we'll accelerate that. Uh, the reality is what's going to be really important for the future of our academy is going to be recruitment. Uh, you know, there's a limit that we have traditionally about players who have come out of the state of Tennessee, which is our territory. I think the idea of trying to hit the open territories – identify players that can add to our group is really important. And I think uh, not just over the course of the last year, but specifically the last six months, Chance and Kevin from a scouting standpoint, along with Rumba and his addition, I think we've accelerated that process. So well, I don't make cryptic Ben with my answer because I just think it's just hard right now to tell. I feel a lot better today than I did a year ago. And I kind of feel like over the next year, I think we'll have some serious discussions about guys who could seriously be considered as homegrowns. Uh, you've seen through MLS Next, uh, we've had a couple of players been uh, invited to participate in all-star game programming, you know, among the best players in, in MLS Next. So when you see that in age groups, and not just the 17s, but in our 15s age group, you see players selected like that, it gives you insight because, you know, the younger players have more time to develop. You have more time to grow them versus a 17 might play one year and then go into college. So I feel, I feel like it's, it's, it's increased uh, with the staff we have and I think our focus on recruitment. The question you asked, the second part about the, the MLS Next Pro in Huntsville is, is an important piece that we've just been lacking. You know, uh, the same way I'd use Rumba's role as a bridge between our academy staff and our first team staff, having a B team to serve as a bridge to give meaningful games to our guys who aren't featuring regularly on our first team, a lot of times those are younger guys. Uh, you know, you look at our group right now, you know, our homegrowns on our first team roster are guys like Ethan Zubak and Hanwala Bawana that each time they come on, they show you something, but they need more meaningful games to do that. Uh, and the reality is, you know, in a 34 game season, there's just not always a lot of time to rotate players into roles like that. You know, so I think giving our young first team players meaningful minutes, you know, in MLS Next Pro is important. But to your point about the homegrowns, that's really going to help us big time from the standpoint of now giving these kids a chance to play outside their comfort zone, to play against men, against MLS players, and really put them on the microscope. Uh, for sure, I can tell you, for those who are following that, that team in Huntsville, the academy kids who are featuring regularly in our MLS Next Pro team, those are our prospects.